March 2011. In that Arab Spring, Syria was seen as the driest of deserts, the regime in full control, opposition virtually non-existent. So it was to some surprise that brave Syrians dared to call out for change too. They were immediately answered with overwhelming force. Sasha Petrosik has walked through the ruin that Syria would soon become. The area is still very dangerous. Overhead, I can hear MiGs flying right now. Everything was surprising. It was scary. It was surreal. All of this started with a series of peaceful protests on the streets of Syrian cities. Men, women and children with placards, with banners, shouting slogans against the regime of President Bashar al-Assad. It wasn't until government forces and these armed thugs that supported the government descended on these protests, trying to quash them, that's when things became violent and everything just snowballed after that. The opposition side believed that maybe they would be successful as they'd seen in other parts of the so-called Arab Spring, but it wasn't to be. Susan Ormiston, now in Moscow, saw early on how far Damascus wanted to take this war. President Assad came out forcefully, said he would never give up. The Syrian army would continue to go on with this war. And at that point, it seemed to set in. It was when a 13-year-old protester, Hamza al-Khatib, was found tortured and killed that many Syrians decided there was no turning back. It would be revolution or death. The planet looked on in shock. Turn your back on this criminal regime. President Assad has lost his legitimacy uh, to govern the uh, Syrian people. Syria would be better off uh, without Assad. But the anger didn't amount to much. The world did not step in. Bashar al-Assad had a free hand. The Syrians we've been able to talk to here... Margaret Evans reported the war through the cracks in the government's efforts at media control. In 2012, when the Syrian government was cracking down so heavily on opposition groups who were mainly headquartered in the suburbs, it was very, very difficult to get to them. Protests would only take place at night. The enclaves were surrounded, the government accusing the opposition of sheltering members of the Free Syrian Army. But we really had to rely on people to help us evade those checkpoints, to shed the government minders, and people did so at great risk to themselves. Inevitably, we would be surrounded by people coming forward wanting to tell you their story. I remember one man saying to me, I don't know what will happen to me after you go, you go because I believe that there are government eyes everywhere, but I still want to talk to you. They wanted to tell you about their missing son, their missing neighbor, the disappearances, the forced conscriptions, the sniper pecking people off in the center of town. And here's where the next turning point happened. Early on in the conflict, Bashar al-Assad released prisoners from Syria's overstuffed jails, including hardened Islamist militants, men who were then joined by extremists from abroad. Together, they wanted to take over the country. This seemed to suit Assad just fine. Suddenly, it looked as if his was a war against a band of terrorists, not a battle against his own people who just wanted a better Syria. This is how ISIS surged and atrocities mounted. As horrific as life and death became in Syria, much of the world still seemed numb to it. If you ask me what was underreported, I think the whole war was underreported. For so long, many journalists had so much difficulty getting in in any way safely. And as the war progressed and the number of combatants joined Syria and became more and more dangerous to travel there. I think the other big turning point was when it became clear that no big outside force, the U.S. in particular, was going to get involved. And that's when many of these extremist groups suddenly started coming out of the woodwork. They armed themselves more and more, and they decided that nothing was too extreme. For years, those refugees who fled Syria seemed to cling to its borders, hoping to soon enough return home. But when the realization hit that there wasn't much of a Syria to return to, the desperate scattered and Europe was blindsided. 
that has been one of the, the most surprising things to me about this conflict is how long it's taken people to leave that huge exodus that we've seen over the past year. I mean, you see some of the video footage from places like homes utterly destroyed. And I do know from talking to so many refugees that the destruction in Syria won't be reconstructed for a decade. So when they were leaving, they weren't saying we're leaving till the bombing stops. They're saying we're leaving because our children will not be able to get an education and grow up in a safe place for a decade. And then came Russia. Vladimir Putin's explosive entry into the war to the rescue of Bashar al-Assad. Under the fatal shadow of Russian air power, the regime was able to push opposition forces back. When Moscow first went in, it said that it was coming in to fight ISIS. If you look at what the Russian planes did, who they bombed over the past months, they were really attacking other opposition groups, the ones that posed the biggest threat to Moscow's ally, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Russia's military went home this week, greeted as conquering heroes, seemed to think their job is done. Putin did Assad a huge favor. The regime is holding firm, but it's not over yet. There is an attempt at negotiating some sort of peace. I'm standing here in Moscow and here, here is where next steps in part will be crafted. And many in the world are hoping that President Putin is resolved to put diplomatic pressure on those talks in Geneva to help make them a success, that maybe the move this week was all about pressuring the Syrian government to come to the table with a compromise, to maybe even suggest to Bashar al-Assad that he needed to think about his political future for the good of the country. Bashar al-Assad stepped down? It's what Syrians and much of the world have called for for five shockingly violent years. He has resisted every ugly day. His fate seeming to matter so much more than the fate of his 22 million countrymen.